Okay, we have uh, Guillermo with us. I will welcome him to the stream. Hello, Guillermo, how are you? Hello, Alba. Fine, thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice. nice to have you here. So you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Okay, we have uh, Guillermo with us. I will welcome him to the stream. Hello, Guillermo, how are you? Hello, Alba. Fine, thank you. Hello. Uh, be careful, Guillermo, you have to mute your uh, stream, uh, sorry, your venue list um, tab because if not, uh, we hear double double sound with delay. So yeah, please do that. Or even you can close it. I will share with you all the comments and questions so you don't have to worry about the venue list. Close it. Okay, now uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, perfect. So, well, thank you all. Um, this short uh, presentation is called Spatial Interaction Models, Internal Migration as Anpos for GIS. My name is Guillermo D'Angelo, and I'm very happy to be with you in, today. So some quick facts about me. I'm a geographer from Uruguay. Um, I'm a GIS analyst and a freelancer and a free open source software user. Sorry, Guillermo, we are not watching your uh, share screen. I mean, your uh, presentation. We are watching the, the, the um, PowerPoint. Si quieres, digo, poner pantalla completa para que se vea en presentación. Oh, okay. Eso, perdón. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me share it again because I thought it was. Mm -hmm. So now it's all okay? Perfect. Perfect, sorry, sorry about that. Well, I'm a geographer from Uruguay, a GIS analyst and freelancer and a free open source software user. So some quick facts about Uruguay. It's inhabited by 3.4 million people, uh, 176,000 square kilometers of emerged land, um, Montevideo is the capital city, which is also the economic center of the country, and it's big and metropolitan, biggest metropolitan area, which um, is inhabited by almost 2 million people, um, and the nominal GDP uh, of our country is 53.6 million, uh, $53 million dollars, um, according to World Bank estimates. So 53.6 uh, thousands million dollars. So here's the general situation. Um, a closer view, uh, Montevideo over there is the capital city. This is Buenos Aires where this event would be host if not by COVID. So we are very close to each other. Some fact about this project, it's an ongoing master thesis degree uh, on demography and population studies uh, from the University of the Republic, uh, which is a public, uh, big public university here in, in, uh, in Uruguay. It's financed by the National Agency of Research and Innovation, NE, and by the Commission of Scientific Research. So about my my software stack may i mainly use for these projects uh, python for data visualization matplotlib seaborn also qgis for cart for cartography and uh, data visualization um data wrangling pandas geopandas um, for the statistical modeling python stats model and, and also r so this would be almost all the software I've been using in this project and other projects projects recently. 
So how internal migration is quantified? Well, in this case, using traditional methods, uh, which is census data, um, where people are asked where they lived five years ago. So that would be a category of the recent migrant, um, which is not a lifetime migrant. Lifetime migrant would be the person that was born in some place and now lives in, in another place. A recent migrant would be the person that five years ago lived in another place, but now live in the in the place where uh, where it was in the time of the census, which uh, in this case was in twenty eleven. So it's quite old now. So regarding the the data, the number of uh, in, internal migrants in Uruguay would be. Uh, almost 150,000, which is 4.5% uh, of the population, okay? So this um, data of recent migrants could, could be, can be uh, interpreted as an origin destination matrix where people declare to have to be living in, in another department in this case, but now it sends in in a, in a different one. So those those are like diets of departments. This is the name of the department, and this is the uh, the code of the department. This is just for for better visualization. Could be like the name uh, in the columns and the name in the rows also. Sorry, the name in the rows and the name in the columns. But just for you to understand, these are the 19 departments of my country. So these are the geographical units that are represented here. Um, but this could also be made with, all, with different units like um, smaller towns or uh, other units. So th those are the fluxes of people between every department organized in this uh, so-called origin destination matrix. Here are the origins and the destinations, and this is the total uh, people uh, migrating from one, from one department to another in, in this elapsed, elapsed time of five years, okay? So this is a cool but way of representation of, of those fluxes which is inspired in some blog posts by Alice Ray. So this, uh, in this song, this uh, bigger concentration of, of blows because, uh, well, it's a capital city and a very dynamically economic, very economic dynamic zone. Sorry, very dynamic economic zone. Um, and every line is, is a flow, okay? So this like uh, blending mode screen, gives you the sense of uh, concentration. This is made in QGIS. The data wrangling was made uh, using um, Python. So this could be also represented in a more traditional way, uh, the corporate maps. Um, as you see, coastal departments are more dynamic regarding internal migration. You see, well, Montevideo, the capital city and the department where the capital city is located. And uh, the coastal departments um, host uh, much of the volume of migrants, internal migrants, and the, their population, it's all, the share of the population, which is internal mi migrant, is also big in comparison, let's say, with no northern departments. Okay, so this is also an interesting fact. If we see closer, we can see that um, those um, towns receiving migrants, um, let's say this is the, again, the capital city. This is a, a close up uh, of the capital city, like a zoom. And you can see in the east, um, these are the number of internal migrants reside at every, every of these town, towns. 
um, where, which is origin is Montevideo. So you can see there's a, a big phenomena here of uh, metropolization, which is people uh, which migrates from the capital city to satellite cities or to uh, suburban housing areas, mainly in the East Coast, okay, it's a, uh, which is called metropolization. It's not a recent phenomena, but it's ever, ever growing, increasing every day. Regarding population structures, structure of those who migrate from the capital city or to the capital or between other departments, uh, you can also um, um, see uh, differences. So these three uh, categories aren't the same. In this case, those who migrate to the capital city are mainly young people, very young people, mainly in, the, in their 20s and in, the, in their early 20s. Um, and also is uh, there are more women migrating women migrating to the capital city this this is strongly related to the presence uh, centralized presence of the university in the capital city which is the public university which is a big attractor for those uh, young people obviously uh, from the from other parts of the country this is a population pyramid. You can see ages in this axis and the percentage of population uh, in the X axis. So people who migrate from Montevideo to the interior, which would say the other departments are um, slightly older people, like in their mid thirties, early forties. Um, and it, it is uh, relatively, well balanced between men's and, and women's and the migration between departments of the so-called interior are uh, a little bit um, more well distributed between ages so this this phenomena can be interpreted as people migrating from uh, the interior to assist the university um, and this could be interpreted in the frame of uh, the metropolization phenomena, which is people, you can see also here, it uh, enlarged for the younger kids. So young couples with uh, kids that migrate, that do this, um, this movement from the capital to the metropolitan areas or satellite cities around the capital. That could be an interesting uh, way of uh, interpreting this. In this other graph, we can see that um, the, the same the phenomena here um, of young, young people in the, in the ranges of the 20s, uh, early 20s, that migrate to Montevideo, which is the red line. The, is, this is a percentage, percentage of internal migrants. So this, is, this spike uh, is extremely big and it refers to that uh, process. So what about spatial interaction models? Spatial interaction mean uh, interdependence between geographical regions, which is based on Ullmann, which was the first that introduced the concept in the 50s. That flows in pla is, uh, implies decisions which are related to attraction, repulsion, or repulsion factors. Attraction could be like, um, like the university, the presence of the university, education facilities, uh, bigger uh, mean average um, uh, salaries or income, um, like, um, I don't know, is um, high unemployment could be repulsion, uh, high uh, the taxes of employment could be attraction, and so on. Um, those flows can be represented as mathematical models. And in terms of migration, every origin destination can be interpreted as a diet. Let's say origin destination could be interpreted as a diet in the flow, like the edge between those uh, two nodes. And the distance uh, could be a factor of repulsion, which is to say that are more fluxes between entities that are close to each other. So people prefer to move to places that are close um, in between. This complex model can be re-specified as Poisson regression models, which are uh, 
and all kind of models is easier to, to deploy. So this the special interaction model can be also, there are three types of special interaction models, at least the origin constraint, destination constraint, and origin destination constraint. And the origin constraint, uh, you, you, you like, you maintain in this matrix the these columns and all those factor factors can move and can be uh, estimated but these uh, have to have to zoom always the same uh, total so this could be used um, to make um, like uh, predictions or scenarios of future migration and that's what that's that is my main objective of this uh, thesis to like uh, make some two or three scenarios of how could this uh, phenomena uh, evolve in the recent uh, years to come. So this is an, an example of uh, Poisson regression summary, which is uh, done in Python using stats model uh, module. This also can be easily done in R, it's almost the same framework, the same structure. So here you, you see the, some uh, regressors that I use, uh, the logarithms of the GDP uh, in destination and the logarithms, logarithm of the distance. And you can see by the sign, the distance is um, like um, repulsion factor and the GDP of the in destiny uh, would be uh, an attraction factor okay those are the the departments um which are the 19 entities that we took in the in the first in one of the first slides which are all our geographical units okay in here you have all the the summary of the model and just for example of of what you you can get with these models so um, conclusions, well, I don't have conclusions to you to share yet, but um, because this is a, an ongoing process, um, but I would like to share some thoughts, thoughts about the process. So reproductibility, reproductibility is required, which is um, you, you have to be able to uh, generate a documented process that can be uh, run again from zero from another um, researcher. So to achieve this, um, coding or pro programming languages are a, a big uh, handy tool to, to get to this. So in this case, I use Python mainly, but this can be done using R or using my, uh, every, I don't know, other programming framework that, that you like. Um, in this case, uh, it will change my work for the better because it helped me to make this reproducible. But also um, applying this uh, um, to this uh, thesis in particular, I gained uh, a lot of skills that were uh, above the, cur the curriculum. So this would be also a, a, very, a very important like thought uh, and lesson learned uh, in this project. Also uh, related to that, that the, the best way to learn to code is to, to start with the project. So um, to get in and, and working in it, it will help you or anybody who wants to learn to code to achieve this, uh, these capabilities. So this all for now, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to, to be sharing this with, with you um, to be here in the Fossil GIS. Thank you, Guillermo. That was a very nice presentation, really nice results. So congratulations for that. And good luck with your thesis. <laughs> um, I, while we wait for questions, I was, um, I wanted to ask you about your experience because you were talking that you were using Python and R 
Um, it was also my experience when I started with the programming. I, I come from an environmental science degree, so no programming background. But then I uh, study a, a environment, um, sorry, a master in uh, special applications. So I, I, I started uh, programming and I started with Python and R in the, in the same uh, time. But then I just uh, went like deep with R and I just very fan of R, I do everything there. And now I'm starting to come back to Python because I think it's all a very powerful tool. So it's, it's being very difficult to be in both worlds. So I wanted to ask yes. you, uh, how is your experience about this? Yes, I, I've seen a lot uh, of people from environmental science, which are like really keen into R. I don't know why, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> very interesting. Um, I come from geography, so no coding background at, at all. I learned, learned all of these um, things um, after I graduated. I mean, I, I yes, I, I know poaches and, and all the things, but not Python. Mm -hmm. So I started with R, but then I want to I wanted to learn Python because it's very popular. So, uh, and then I, I liked uh, Python much more and I, I want, I, I'm not willing to go back to her. It's like a personal preference. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't know exactly why uh, this happens, but it happens. So in my case, no, I have to do some things on her. Why? Because my, one of my tutors, uh, the, the background is statistics, obviously. So statistics prefer uh, error because it, it was made for by and for statistics statisticians yep. sorry so it's like um it's 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 important to know both in in, in academics but uh, you always be um strong stronger in in one of in one of the two i think yeah Maybe it's just about taste because uh, I don't have uh, also an explanation. I'm really trying to come back to Python because I have to do some machine learning things and yes. and I really miss R every time I'm in Python. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I don't know what happens, uh, why it happens, but maybe it's like once you get a grip on R or Python, uh, you you it's much effort to keep in your head both languages uh, running at the same time. Maybe yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I don't know what the audience uh, say has to say about this matter. I think uh, they will have a lot of uh, strong opinion. Uh, I think most uh, people here will uh, say have, have the same opinion as you because I know Python is much uh, easier uh, to program. It's more simple, I know, but I don't know, R is just like, has a lot of tools uh, already wrapped and very easy to use. So maybe this is uh, the reason, but I think both languages are great. So uh, it was nice to see that you could uh, use both of them and the comparison you, you made. Also all the nice graphics, I think you, you made them in Python. Yes. All of the bubble, but okay, they were very nice. So that's But also they, they also can be done using ggplot in our Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> so, okay, great. Uh, I don't see any questions in the pool. Okay, I have one. R has a stronger security and safety environment. Cron is fantastic. <laughs> so another R <laughs> farm. <laughs> yes, Cron, it's, it's very interesting because sometimes I use the Python distribution uh, made by Anaconda and mm -hmm. the repository Conda Forge. Sometimes I have problems to, to install packages. I have to use pip. So, and sometimes I, I have to use the so-called wheels, which I, is like downloading a package and then installing it. Mm -hmm. So Crank and Air Studio are also like um, interesting things about Air in comparison. But in the other hand, you have, you have Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, um, which are also great tools. You have also R Markdown. <laughs> R Markdown, yes, yes. Yeah. It's yes, very yes, also yes. very very nice. I just use it uh, this uh, in the Force 4 G for a nice workshop that I uh, did on um, uh, Monday on Tuesday, sorry, and it was also very nice. But yeah, I think uh, Jupyter Notebook are great. So that's also something to compare. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any more questions. 
So if there aren't any more comments, uh, I think we can uh, finish this uh, nice session. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for, for your talk and uh, your comments and uh, the discussion. And uh, I wish you all the best with your uh, studies. Well, thank you. Again, it was a pleasure to be here. Um, well, thank you. Thank you all. Okay. See <laughs> you. Goodbye.